Welcome and bonjour. My name is John Capucci. I'm the Stephen Jaroslavsky Chair in Religion and Conflict here at Assumption University. And in my spare time, I'm also principal as well. Before we begin this evening, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that Assumption University resides on the traditional territory of the Odawa, the Ojibwa, the Potawatomi, and we also acknowledge the generous gift of land from the Huron. Assumption University, founded in 1857 as Assumption College, is one of the most historic Roman Catholic universities in Canada. Informed by the Basilian tradition, we seek to empower individuals to cultivate goodness in themselves and others, embody discipline in their paths towards excellence, and recognize the importance of constantly pursuing knowledge throughout their lives. We are also a federated university of the University of Windsor and affiliated with Canterbury College and Iona College. On that note, I would like to acknowledge our co-sponsors for this evening, Canterbury College and Iona College. And I would like to introduce the principals of those two institutions, Principal Gordon, Dr. Gordon Drake of Canterbury College and Principal Norman King, Dr. Norman King of Iona College. And I thank them for their generous offer to co-sponsor the event. And finally, as always, I would like to thank the Jaroslavsky Foundation and the Bazillion Fathers of Sandwich for co-endowing the chair. Before I introduce this, uh, our guest speaker this evening, I would like to extend a very warm and special welcome to the elders and academic leaders who are joining us from almost coast to coast. At the top of the list, we welcome former Shingwok. Uh, residential sc uh, school students and the children of the Shingwaok Alumni Association in Sault Ste. Marie. We are joined by two elders, Elder Shirley Roach and Elder Jackie Fletcher. In addition, I would like to welcome uh, my counterparts and colleagues from 10 Canadian universities from uh, the East Coast all the way to the Rocky Mountains. We begin by welcoming our friend and neighbor, Dr. Robert Gordon, President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Windsor. We also welcome Mr. Mario Turco, Chancellor of Algoma University in Sault Ste. Marie, Elder Shirley Horn, past and inaugural Chancellor of Algoma Vizina, President and Vice Chancellor of Algoma University, Dr. Peter Ricketts, President and Vice Chancellor of Acadia University in Wolfville, Nova Scotia. Dr. Andy Haken, President of St. Francis Xavier University, also in Nova Scotia. Dr. Peter Meehan, President and Vice Chancellor of St. Jerome's University in Waterloo, and also the Chair of the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities in Canada. Dr. Jerry Turcott, President and Vice Chancellor of St. Mary's University in Calgary. Father Dr. John Meehan, President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Sudbury. Dr. Christopher Adams, Rector of uh, St. Paul's College in Winnipeg. Dr. Carl Still, President of St. Thomas More College in Saskatoon. And Dr. James Curry, Interim Principal, uh, President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Winnipeg. Now it brings me great honor to introduce our keynote speaker for this evening. I'm happy to provide a biography for him. I can actually go on and on about his biography, but I know we're limited for time. And then I will very happily uh, in, uh, give our speaker some time to address the audience. And then at the end, we will have a little bit of time for questions. So if you have any questions, please put them in the uh, chat feature and uh, we'll do our best to, uh, to ask and answer as many as we can. So as I mentioned, it is my privilege to honor and introduce the Honorable Senator Murray Sinclair. Senator Sinclair has served the justice system in Canada for over a quarter century. He was the first Aboriginal judge appointed in Manitoba and Canada's second. He served as co-chair of the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry in Manitoba and as the chief commissioner of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission or TRC. As head of the TRC, he participated in hundreds of hearings across the country, culminating in the issuance of the TRC's report in 2015. 
He has served as an adjunct professor of law at the University of Manitoba, uh, where he has been very active within his profession and his community. He has won numerous awards, including the National Aboriginal Achievement Award in 1994, the Lifetime Aboriginal Achievement Award in 2017 from INSPIRE, the Manitoba Bar Association's Equity Award in 2001, the Distinguished Service Award in 2016. He has also recently won the, Manito the uh, President's Award from the Canadian Bar Association in 2018 and uh, the Simmons Medal in 2019. In addition, Senator Sinclair has received 14 honorary doctorates from various Canadian universities, and many of whom are represented this evening. In 2016, the then Dr. Sinclair was appointed to the Canadian Senate. And while in the Canadian Senate, he has served on the Standing Committee on Aboriginal Peoples and the Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me and Assumption University in welcoming our keynote speaker for this evening, Senator Murray Sinclair. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction and uh, thank uh, everyone who's uh, online and hooked up with us to uh, watch this event uh, for, for being here with us. Uh, we're going to have uh, an opportunity later on to uh, respond to some of your questions that you're going to send in through the chat feature on this uh, system. So um, as we're going along, I'm sure you're going to have some things that you might be provoked to uh, ask about. So feel free to, to send your questions in and we'll have a Q&A session after we're over. Uh, I wanted to um, be sure that uh, we engage in that way because uh, I've attended as a speaker a number of these events, but I've uh, also uh, watched a number of these events and I've always thought it's important for people to feel that what they're getting from it is something that they can ask about or something that they need to understand. So uh, feel free to do that. I uh, want to welcome all of you who are uh, uh, people that I've come to know over the years, uh, some friends who are participating in this event as uh, members of the audience and who are uh, linked into us. I appreciate your support. Uh, some of you have uh, emailed me or texted with me uh, or spoken to me on the phone about your intention to um, sign in and be part of the evening. And so I, I welcome you and thank you for being here. Uh, <clears throat> this evening's uh, talk um, is one that uh, I've thought about a lot and haven't had a, a chance really to talk publicly about it very much. I've talked with uh, various friends and acquaintances and close advisors about the issue of uh, reconciliation uh, and uh, Christianity. Um, but I think it's probably a dialogue that we need to have because it is one of the hurdles that we see on both sides um, but of the uh, discussion around reconciliation within Canada. And uh, I think that we have to start uh, giving some thought to the question in order to be able to contribute to the dialogue, but also to assist uh, particularly our younger people. And um, in, in my view, uh, young Indigenous people who are coming to their sense of self, their sense of culture, their sense of self-respect, their sense of validation in a way that sometimes uh, festers in the uh, uh, a bit of anger about the history of oppression, the history of uh, forced assimilation and, uh, and uh, forced culturalization that has gone on, particularly within residential schools, but in society generally. And that uh, resentment that results from that can uh, be a, a threat to our being able to develop a sense of mutual respect for each other. So I. I think it's an important topic and I can't uh, emphasize enough that uh, we haven't discussed it enough. We need to discuss it more 
And my intention this evening maybe is to give some thought to you, some things for you to think about uh, in terms of how we can approach a conversation like this. Um, first of all, though, let me talk about my credentials so that uh, those of you who don't know me very well or may not have been totally persuaded by the uh, introduction and the references to the uh, words and such that uh, are part of my career uh, can see why this might be something that uh, I would have something that I could contribute to. Uh, in the last 30 years or so, I have dedicated my uh, career, my life, uh, to the issue of reconciliation, uh, the issue of uh, re revealing the truth about what has been happening to Indigenous people, what is currently happening to Indigenous people, and why that is also. It is important for us to be able to uh, have a discussion and dialogue uh, around reconciliation, uh, but in order for us to be able to do so properly, it's also very important for us to have a true understanding of how this relationship that we now have uh, came about and what the role of each of the sides or the perspectives that we bring to the conversation uh, has uh, contributed to the, this relationship in this way. It's probably fair to say that uh, for the vast majority of Indigenous young people, those under the age of 40 or so, um, being able to see a future uh, with mutual respect as part of the equation uh, is difficult at this point in time. And part of that is, I think, because they haven't heard the kind of words that they need to hear from those who are representative of the uh, oppressor side of the relationship that has been in place for so long. And um, my work with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, was intended partly to uh, unveil that history, but also partly to show how uh, the relationship at the beginning uh, was one of mutual respect and could have been uh, if uh, if history had not gone in the direction that it did, could have been maintained. And, uh, and uh, the relationship we have today could, be, could have been different. Uh, one of the questions that I always ask Indigenous youth when I meet with them and when I talk with them, and in my um, current role as a mentor to young Indigenous lawyers, I always ask them to think about what would our situation be like here in Canada as Indigenous people, as Indigenous uh, professionals, as Indigenous lawyers, uh, if uh, uh, history had not gone the way that it did, if we had uh, settlers who came from other parts of the world, but who came armed with a um, full and proper knowledge of who we were and a full and proper respect for who we were and what we had and maintained that respect throughout the years and uh, worked with it to ensure that it continued to grow, continued to be nurtured. And in order that we could have a, a positive relationship, what would that relationship be like today? How would we be getting along? What would we be doing with and about each other? Uh, and that often makes people think, uh, think deeply about uh, how we could have, uh, that we could have had things differently if things hadn't gone the way that they did. Uh, so uh, I'm not gonna go through the, uh, all the details of the history of oppression, the residential schools, the legislation that the government put into place, the attitude of government, the attitude of uh, media throughout the years, the uh, treatment of Indigenous people in our textbooks in schools, uh, the way that Indigenous people were taught about in public schools, the way that Indigenous people were portrayed in movies, in books, in stories. Um, and the 
lack of respect that that engendered in generation after generation, uh, not only uh, on the part of non-Indigenous students in the public schools, but also eventually on the part of Indigenous people who came to uh, a situation where they were uh, living uh, the myth of inferiority. They were living in accordance with what they had been taught in school, which is that they came from a people of inferior stock, that they had uh, no history worth speaking about, that their culture and their languages were invalid, that they were uh, uncivilized, their people were uncivilized, and that uh, in order for them to succeed, they had to assimilate into uh, white Canada. Uh, and that belief on the part of Indigenous people has caused uh, and continues to cause today a lot of problems. Um, but I think probably the most significant issue that it causes is it causes uh, Indigenous youth to sometimes come in conflict with members of their own family, their grandparents or their parents uh, who still want them to um, adopt ad and adapt to uh, that some of those beliefs that they themselves learned in the public schools. Uh, so the sense of self-respect, the sense of identity that Indigenous people got out of the public schools, if they got one at all, was that they had to be like the white man. They had to join society. They had to succeed in society in order to be worth anything. And they had to contribute to society in order to have merit. Uh, and that uh, myth of inferiority on the part of Indigenous people was accompanied by a myth of superiority on the part of the uh, white European settlers who came here. And that sense of uh, superiority that was brought into the dialogue uh, early on um, became part of the policies of government and became part of the way that society um, itself functioned. Uh, because of the important role that the public school system played in uh, furthering that myth of superiority. So in the school system, we were taught, of course, that uh, um, the discovery of North America by Euro Europeans uh, was a wonderful thing. Um, in the United States, of course, Columbus Day is a national holiday and uh, is accompanied by uh, more and more celebration. Uh, whereas the true history of Christopher Columbus is uh, very negative when it comes to indigenous people. He was probably the first uh, genocidist who uh, came into a relationship with indigenous people in North America. Uh, by most accounts, he was responsible for the murders and the deaths of anywhere between nine and um, 39 of 40 million Indigenous people over the course of a very short period of time uh, after his arrival in uh, North America. Uh, and that um, relationship uh, that that created, that sense of uh, conflict that you know, was engendered by that is part of the stories that many uh, Southern uh, tribes and, and uh, indigenous people in Central America and South America still talk about today. Uh, but that, uh, that myth of superiority that in, uh, European people brought civilization to this part of the world, they brought um, a sense of uh, knowledge about the physical laws of nature, about uh, all of the things that any society needed to know uh, has resulted in, uh, in Indigenous children believing in their inferiority and non-Indigenous children believing in their superiority when it came to Indigenous people. And uh, our education together in the public schools uh, has uh, continued that belief system, those mutually mythological belief systems for generations. It was certainly taught when I was going to school in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. It was taught as well when my children were going to school. And in some places, it's still taught today. Um, and probably in most places, it's still taught today. 
there's a very recent study um, on the, uh, the fact that public school system in the United States and in Canada um, basically taught white supremacy. And the doctrine of white supremacy is that to be white was better than to be non-white. And, uh, and that, that helps to understand the relationship between uh, non-Indigenous people, i.e. the white people, and uh, every other race of people, not just in North America, but around the world as well. Uh, so those are the factors that are kind of at play here. Some of them known and some of them unknown, but certainly lived on the part of those of us who've been part of this experience. And, and of course, the, the teachings of what went on in the public school system were generally supported by the teachings of Christianity. The doctrine of discovery was a very Christian principle. It was uh, perpetrated by the Pope uh, initially and uh, was used in order to authorize the um, um, authority of various nations, Christian nations as they were called, to uh, claim land around the world from indigenous people who were not considered to be at the same level, in some cases not even considered to be humans because they were not Christian nations. And, uh, and those of you who know Catholic history will know that uh, in 1520, there was a, uh, a hue and cry that was raised by uh, people like uh, Bartolome de las Casas, who had written uh, to the Vatican to express his displeasure at what he had witnessed as a, uh, as a priest in North America as part of Columbus's expedition. Uh, what he experienced and what he saw uh, the Spanish conquistadors doing to indigenous people. And he decried that in his materials. And as a result, there was a, a meeting, a hearing that was held. Um, and the question that was asked at that meeting was, are indigenous people in fact human beings or not? And at the end of the day, they concluded that indigenous people in North America were indeed human beings, but they were of a lesser kind and not of the same kind as the white people who had discovered them and could claim, continue to claim their lands uh, through the doctrine of discovery and the doctrine of terra nullius. Even though they lived on the land, terra nullius said that they were not capable of occupying the land as civilized people and therefore the land was considered to be vacant land for anyone, anyone's taking who was from a Christian nation a representative of a Christian nation. Um, so that kind of marked the nature of the relationship going forward. And it's been part and parcel of the teachings that have gone into our school system for many, many generations. I can remember being in high school and, and this was in the 60s, being in high school, and our teachers still taught that indigenous people who fought in wars alongside British and French in uh, the war for North America uh, were, were um, um, treated as uh, colleagues in the military force, uh, primarily because they, they were prepared to do savage things and that they were used for, for causing fear to be raised on the part of those on the other side, uh, that they were bloodthirsty, uh, warlike, and scary people. And that was uh, the image that we were raised with in schools. And the role of the um, teachings of the church, and it wasn't just the church, churches themselves that participated in this, it was just those who were raised to be Christian uh, often found solace in the teachings of the church that this was okay, that this message was fine. This message was consistent with the teachings of Christianity that had been espoused for so long. Um, and uh, they were certainly part and parcel of the residential school system. You know, um, so in one way, I was I was part of the the crowd of the large crowd of indigenous and non-indigenous people who were negatively affected in this way by the teachings of our school system, and 
So I, I come to this conversation as one of its victims um, over the years. Uh, at the same time, um, as part of the indoctrination that we all underwent to believe that we had to succeed and become part of the system, uh, I do want you to know that uh, I, I embraced that for a long period of time. Uh, I was born in 1951. Uh, my mother passed away in 1952, shortly after the birth of my younger brother. Uh, she suffered a heart attack, but her heart attack was caused by her physical um, uh, limitations brought about by the fact that she was a victim of tuberculosis for so long. Tuberculosis was a disease that was rampant in the indigenous community, not so much in the non-indigenous community, but in the indigenous community. And she had been a victim of tuberculosis and had been uh, living in a sanatorium as well as uh, being uh, uh, living in hospitals for a long period of time. Um, but uh, when she died, my father, who had uh, uh, who was a member of the St. Peter's Band at the time, um, had uh, gone to war for Canada and fought in the Second World War and had been badly injured in the war and, and suffered serious trauma from those injuries. Uh, suffered, of course, another major emotional trauma at her loss. Uh, I spent uh, a lot of time in, uh, with him in his uh, deathbed just before he died. We spent a long time sitting and talking and uh, he revealed a lot to me that of course at that time, uh, he died in 1994. And, uh, and during that time he told me, and I believe him, that she was the only one that he ever loved and that he never ever felt any love for anybody else, not just uh, another woman, but he said uh, no other people, no other person, even his children, he never loved them because he had, well, he had his love for other humans died with her. And so he apologized to all of us, his, his children, about having lived his life that way. Uh, but I actually told him that he was wrong because just before he died in the years uh, leading up to his death, uh, he had come to be a, a real source of fascination and a real genuine love object by his grandchildren, all of whom really loved him. And he in turn loved them very deeply and he cared much for them. And uh, so in, in some ways they brought him back to this world, uh, which is why he could open up as well as he did at the end. But that was, uh, uh, a reflection of the, the importance that he bore to them. My children, I uh, always tell them, had a very different relationship with my father than I did over the years. But when he uh, suffered the loss of his wife, there were four of us in the, in, in the family, four children. I had an older brother, an older sister, myself and my younger brother. We were asked to go and live with my grandparents. Um, and we did. Uh, they were in their 60s when we went to live with them. And they had already had uh, and were raising 13 children. When we went to live with them, there were still eight of them living at home, in fact. Uh, five aunties and uh, three of my uncles were still living at home. Uh, and when uh, we went to live with my grandparents, uh, when I, I think about it now, and I thought about it for a long time, I thought that must have been overwhelming because um, I'm, I'm in my 60s and I'm just about 70. Uh, I can't imagine, because my grandfather was 69 when we went to live with him, I can't imagine as a grandfather um, suddenly having five young children, uh, four young children um, coming into your life that you're responsible for. Uh, one of them only a few weeks old. Um, and the oldest one only four years old. So uh, how do you how do you manage that? It must have been very challenging. It must have been maybe overwhelming. But my grandmother, bless her heart, who was a very strong woman, strong-willed woman, um, she had an answer. And what she did was she created a child welfare system. And that child welfare system, she uh, 
assigned each one of us as the children. Uh, she assigned each one of us to one of the aunties. And so I was effectively raised in my grandmother's house by one of my aunties. Um, now, this auntie that I was assigned to, uh, her responsibility was to make sure that I ate my meals, that I did my chores, that I um, took my baths, that I was ready for school in the morning, that uh, I did my homework, and that uh, I was um, a, a good person. Her responsibility was to make sure that I behaved myself. And, uh, and each of the other aunts who were raising my brothers and my sister were also doing the same thing. And, uh, but this was all in that household. And my uh, grandmother had gone to a residential school in uh, Fort Alexander, Manitoba, north of Winnipeg. Uh, and uh, she had been placed there by her father who was from Quebec. Uh, he was a Sima and um, he was a Frenchman. And he had come to Manitoba in order to work in the lumber trade. And um, as part of his tradition in his family, uh, he dedicated one of his children to the church, and she was the one that he dedicated. Uh, so he dedicated her to become a nun. And she was sent to live in the residential school, but not with the students in the dormitory. She was sent to live with the nuns in the convent. And she was raised as a novitiate in order to prepare her for the uh, for life as a sister in the, in the convent. And, uh, and so she was never allowed to leave. She, she lived there from the time she was a little girl, about five years old, until she was a young woman. And uh, she was only allowed to leave because she decided she didn't want to be a nun and uh, asked to be released. And uh, they said that they would if she could find a husband. So it's hard for somebody living in a convent to find a husband, as you can imagine, but she managed to, uh, because every month there would be young men who would come to the school asking for young women to marry, because they wanted to marry a young Christian woman. And uh, so from the residential school girls that were there, um, they chose one and married them. And my uh, grandmother was one of the women, one of the young women whose name was allowed to go forward. And uh, it was my grandfather who came one day and selected her to be his wife. She says she selected him by telling all the other girls not to go forward with their interview. And, uh, and thereby, whatever process you accept happened, they, they got married. Um, but she was still a very dedicated Catholic. And uh, so because she had, uh, had uh, given up on the life of becoming a, a nun, she was required as one of the conditions of her leaving the convent that she had to dedicate one of her children to uh, the church. And, uh, and so she said that she would. Um, there were other conditions, of course, that my grandfather had to agree to, but uh, that was uh, an important one. And, uh, she couldn't convince any of her children to become uh, members of the church or become a part of the church. And uh, when we came along, in some ways, I think she saw an opportunity because as I was being raised from the time I was very little, uh, I was told that my future was to become a priest. And so from the time I was a little boy until well into my teenage years, uh, I believed and I accepted that I was going to become a priest. And uh, she, she'd already worked out with the local priest, which uh, seminary I was going to go to in order to study to be uh, in the priesthood. Um, but uh, I'd like to say that uh, my vision of life opened up and I saw a future without being a priest, but actually it was girls that attracted me. and. Uh, and uh, that life of uh, living as a priest uh, lost its appeal uh, when I was in high school. And uh, I decided I wanted to go to university. And uh, she, she required me to, uh, as a condition of doing that, um, she required me to commit my life to helping others. And so 
every time I, I have a decision to make about what to do with my career, with my life, it's always her voice in my, my brain somewhere, which says, this is what you should do. And so that's a driving force for me. So, but during that whole time that I was a young boy um, and a, a, young, a young man, as a young teenager, I studied to become a priest. I went to uh, uh, take courses. I, I studied uh, under a Jesuit uh, brother who came to the community to teach uh, those of us whose families were Catholic and uh, learned a great deal about the church and about the teachings of the church that way. And uh, for the, when I was a teenager, I was ready to make that commitment. Uh, and when I, when I changed my mind and decided to go to university, those teachings, of course, stayed with me for a long time and still do, in fact, uh, resound with me once in a while. And, and on reflecting about that uh, as the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, it occurred to me that, you know, there, the teachings of the church uh, about humanity, about life, about uh, who we are as people, um, are not so dissimilar from the teachings of uh, traditional indigenous elders. Uh, because as a young uh, father, when, uh, when I got married and had my son, I was going through a real identity crisis. And I've been going through an identity crisis most of my life, actually, but I didn't realize it until uh, the day that I was holding him after he was born. And I realized that I didn't have anything to give to him when it came to him understanding who he was as an indigenous uh, man, as a Anishinaabe. And uh, so I, I said to myself, I'm going to find out what it means to be Anishinaabe and I'm going to ensure that he understands what that means too. And so for the last uh, 45 years or so, uh, I have dedicated my, my uh, life to understanding what it means to be Anishinaabe and, and how to help myself uh, become a better human being through those teachings. I go to ceremonies, I go to um, work with elders, I talk to elders all the time. I've been initiated into the Medeiran Lodge. I'm a, a chief of the Medeiran Lodge and responsible in fact for teaching Medeiran teachings to young indigenous people who come looking for understandings of life. And uh, my wife and I both work in that way together. And, uh, and our children also follow that way. Uh, our children are all born with indigenous names uh, and they can choose. We gave them the choice of whether they want to use an English name or not, um, but they all prefer to use their indigenous names. And, uh, and because their indigenous names have teachings, their indigenous names have a story and those stories mean something to them. And it's a uh, part of who they are. It reflects upon uh, what they're meant to do and how they're meant to do it. So I, um, I think about the importance of that identity journey and understanding who you are and the teachings that go with being a, a Anishinaabe. And, uh, and I think, you know, uh, when, we look at what it was that the church stands for, not so much about those who were in charge of the church tried to do, uh, because in some, in some ways, in many ways, I consider the, the leaders of the church in the past to have uh, wrongly interpreted their responsibility and wrongly interpreted the true teachings of the church and applied them in a way that was uh, harmful to the people. Um, but uh, that aside, uh, uh, the teachings that we teach our, our children, for example, are uh, honesty, humility, uh, respect, courage, uh, wisdom, truth, and love. So, uh, and, and we have stories and teachings around how they're to use that and how they're to understand that. And those are not dissimilar from teachings of the church, um, of any church, uh, whether it's a 
Presbyterians, the United Church, the Anglicans, even uh, I had a, a long discussion with um, Muslim people at a conference that I was speaking at. And uh, even their teachings from the Quran were very similar to our own teachings as, uh, as indigenous people. And it's the loss of the purity of the teaching that uh, often results in things going wrong. And we need to understand that. Now, uh, having said that, of course, there are some cults that uh, deliberately misuse those teachings and those understandings, but that's a different issue. It's about whether the, the teachings of, of Jesus or the teachings of uh, Muhammad uh, are really consistent with what our um, uh, original uh, ancestor taught us as well. Uh, Anishinaabe, when lowered to the earth, brought all these teachings to us. And we spend a lot of time um, talking amongst ourselves as elders in the, in the lodge, as teachers in the lodge. We talk a lot about what these teachings mean. And we share those understandings with our young people so that they can grow up knowing how to apply them on a daily basis and live in a way that is consistent and be able to reach for them and use them uh, whenever they're challenged, whenever they're faced with difficulties and difficult decisions. Uh, because we want that voice that's in the back of their head, that's talking to them all the time, to be a voice that is consistent with those teachings. We want them to, to feel that knowledge, to be able to see how to utilize it. And, and those teachings have stood me in good stead over the years. Um, early on in my legal career as a lawyer, uh, I, I was really challenged by the way the legal system was treating me. I, uh, you know, I often tell the story about when I first appeared in court, uh, the judge uh, mistook me for an accused person and uh, wanted me to enter a plea to a charge that was not my charge because I wasn't charged with anything, but he wanted me to enter a plea and he got very angry at me when I refused to plead to a charge. And, uh, and basically he said, you know, that's all you Indian people are good for is to stand there and, and disobey everything that we tell you. And, and I, you're not the only one that's left this courtroom. He said, uh, not doing what you're supposed to do. And, uh, and uh, another time when I went to bail out a client, as a, I was a lawyer, I went to bail out a client who had been arrested for drunk driving. And I successfully got a bail order to get him released. Uh, when I went to the cells in order to have the guard release him, uh, the guard, uh, after we had, I had interviewed my client, uh, the guard mistakenly, grabbed my arm and was going to put me back in the cells and let my client go because he was a white guy and I wasn't. So um, after experiences like that, and there were others, uh, I decided to quit being a lawyer. And, uh, and I thought, this is not for me. I, I can't put up with this anymore. And uh, my family, my, my wife persuaded me to go and talk to an elder about these experiences. And, and I did. And, uh, and bless his heart, uh, an elder by the name of Angus Merrick agreed to see me. He spent the whole day with me. He listened to my stories. He listened to my experiences and what I had gone through and how I was feeling. And then uh, at the end of the day, after he, I had finished talking and finished crying, at the end of the day, he looked at me and he said, if you don't want to be a lawyer, don't be a lawyer. He said, but remember this, that even if you're not a lawyer, you understand law and people will always come to you and ask you to help them with the law because you have that knowledge and they don't. So you're always going to have that role to play in their lives, but you don't have to be a lawyer to do that. But if you decide that you're going to stay as a lawyer, to work as a lawyer, you have other things that you have to learn first, he said. You have to learn what it means to be a human being. You have to learn what it means to be a father. You have to learn what it means to be a son, 
You have to learn what it means to be a brother to your sister. You have to learn what it means to be a, a grandfather to your grandchildren when they come. You have to learn what it means to be a, a friend to all of the people of this community. You have to learn to love the people. And you have to learn to love the people even when they don't love you because you're a leader, he said, and that's what leaders do. So you go and decide what it is that you want to do. And then when you need help, come back and see me. And so almost before I left his yard, I decided that I was going to stay in law. And uh, I went back and talked to him frequently about various issues that were going on. And he always said, you have to go and and find your answers sitting on your mother, the earth. You have to go and talk to the earth. You have to go and talk to the creator and find out how to deal with that. You have to go into sweats. You have to go to ceremonies because there is where you find your answers. And your answers are deep within you. And you have to figure out through ceremony how to release those answers so that you can live them. And that is also true about what we tell young people who are looking for answers within the church. Um, if you want to know how to solve that, you have to talk to God. You have to pray to God and look for guidance. Um, and you have to understand when you are being guided, when you are being given those answers. And so in many ways, our faiths are no different. Uh, we, we are looking for the same thing. We are talking to the one great being that is out there. Uh, I remember being in a discussion with uh, a priest one time. Uh, this is when I was a young man. And, uh, and he said, you know, the problem with Indians, he said, is that they believe in too many gods and that uh, there's only one God. And I said, I agree, there's only one God. And if he, there is only one God, then he's my God too. Um, and if you think that we're talking to different gods because we talk to the earth, that we talk to the trees, or we talk to the animals, you have to understand that uh, that one God has put his spirit in all of us, in all of creation, uh, that he is present before us all the time. If you want to see God's work in front of you, just watch the animals, watch the children, each of the little children. Uh, and look at what they're doing and how they're doing things and answer their questions. Sometimes the most difficult questions that I have to answer are asked of, my, asked of me by my grandchildren. And uh, they're always challenging me, and rightfully so, because they're the ones who have the biggest and emptiest baskets that we have to fill. So can we reconcile Christianity and our teachings? Yes, we can. But that does not mean that either one of us has to surrender what we have and what we believe. What it means is that we have to learn to respect what each of us has and what each of us believes. We have to learn how to walk hand in hand. We have to learn how to be friends as we originally had talked about when we first came together. Um, years ago when I was asked to explain what reconciliation was I said this, reconciliation means only one thing. I want to be your friend and I want you to be mine so that we can walk this land together. And when I need your help, you'll be there to help me. And when you need my help, I'll be there to help you. And that's consistent with my teachings and is consistent with yours. And if we learn how to do that, if we learn how to coexist in that respectful, kind, humble way, then reconciliation will occur. So I've probably spoken far too long. I know I have, in fact. But uh, nonetheless, I needed to get those words in front of you to help you um, begin to think about things, maybe, that you might not have thought about. Um, so that you can give some 
meaning to that question about how do we reconcile Christianity with traditional indigenous knowledge. It's not that difficult, but it does require effort. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, for your engaging, insightful, and, and uh, personal uh, talk on, on Christian Indigenous relations. Um, at this time, if you don't mind, I'd like to open up the virtual floor for some questions. Um, we already have one question in, but for people that are interested in posing a question, if you can just uh, include it in the chat feature on, uh, on YouTube, we will, uh, I'll read it to, uh, to the Senator. So our first question that we have uh, this evening is if Christianity, Islam and indigenous teachings are similar, then why are we still divided? Uh, <laughs> it's because uh, there are those who will take, advantages, uh, take advantage of the fact that we uh, have different terms for what it was that we use or how, that, how, how it is that we approach things. We have different practices. We have different uh, techniques of expression and they make more of that than they really should. And, and as a result, they take advantage of it by uh, alleging that one is superior to the other. And just as uh, there are uh, there are people of the Christian faith who teach that Christianity is superior to uh, uh, the Muslim faith. There are Muslims who teach that the Muslims are superior to the Christians, and uh, and uh, neither one of them is right, um, because it is about uh, what we believe in. It's about uh, living in accordance with the teachings as we understand them, and if we did that then we would be able to overcome this uh, sense of division that others try to create within us. Uh, I am confronted all the time by people who challenge me uh, to prove to them that I am as good as they are. And I don't have to do that. I just do what I do. I say what I say. I think what I think, and I dedicate my life to the way that I live. And so as a way of expression, uh, that doesn't leave a lot of room for people to be able to say that I'm not as good as they are, um, because I defy them to say how we are different. And they end up for this, you're not as good as me because I'm a Christian and you're not, or I'm a Muslim and you're not, or I'm this and you're not. Uh, and I said, well, if that's the premise of your conversation, then uh, no one will ever be as good as you. And that can't be the case. It's not the teachings of Jesus as I know them and as I learned them. Thank you, Senator. Are there any other questions that uh, people might have? I know there's a little bit of a delay between the Zoom chat and the YouTube uh, live stream, so I'll give people uh, a few seconds to, uh, to catch up on us. This is like a, a matrix, right? There's, there's really, uh, the reality is all about pictures. <laughs> That's right, it is. <laughs> All these uh, technologies, right? Eh? Yeah. So. Well, it may be that we gave them all the answers they needed. I, I guess That's, that might be what this is a reflection of, or maybe they're all thinking. But that would be good too, either way. I think the delay is, uh, is about a minute, so. Oh, that far, wow, okay. Oh, we have another question. To grow in mutual respect, and that's in quotations, is a noble goal, 
From your experience across Canada, what functions or events have succeeded? What function or events uh, have succeeded at what? I don't understand. What's the first part of the question again? To grow in mutual respect. That was in quotation. <clears throat> is it, uh, is it I guess the, I guess the premise is uh, is there a situation where we have a a, a relationship of mutual respect? Um, and the answer to that is yes, we do. Um, I've, I've been invited to many congregations where I've seen in, indigenous and non-indigenous people uh, congregating and talking and dialoguing in a relationship of mutual respect. <clears throat> I, I have many friends of different faiths uh, with whom I have conversations about these uh, ideas, about these thoughts, about our practices, <clears throat> uh, in which it's a conversation of mutual respect. Um, and, you know, uh, those, uh, that relationship of mutual respect is, uh, it, it may be seen by some as an ideal. I think it's actually a, a precondition. It's, uh, it's a pre-existing condition, I should say. Uh, it's, an ex it's a condition that we uh, lived in for a long time, even with the arrival of Europeans at the outset. The, the, uh, those who arrived early knew that in order for them to be able to get along and to be able to stay here, that they had to respect the traditions of the indigenous people who were here. And they did. The first ceremony that was ever held in this land uh, was when uh, John Cabot and his, uh, his, uh, his, his people who, who traveled with him uh, arrived in Canadian shores, and they participated in the ceremony with the uh, Eastern tribes of people who were represented uh, at that gathering. And, and that was an indigenous ceremony and uh, they willingly participated in it. They may not have believed in it in the sense that uh, they didn't understand what it was all about and they didn't accept it as part of their faith, but that's fine. I go to, uh, I, I go to Christian ceremonies all the time. I go to Muslim ceremonies all the time. And uh, I, I don't um, understand necessarily everything that's being said or everything that's going on, but I have a lot of respect for it. I have a lot of respect for the fact that this is designed to assist people to learn how to live uh, a good life. Okay, uh, we have uh, quite a few questions, so maybe we'll just take two more. Um, this one is, uh, I'll read it for you. There are Indigenous people who are both Indigenous and Christian. They practice traditional Indigenous spirituality and are also practicing Christians. Any thoughts about that? Uh, well, yeah, I've heard it said by some elders that in order to, uh, you know, when you leave this world, in order to travel the spirit road, that you have to decide which spirit road you're going to follow. Um, but I, I and I've also heard other elders, and I, it's, this is more of a belief that I follow, is I don't think it really matters. You know, if you live a good life, uh, at the end of the day, when you're, you're traveling that road to go back to the creator, which is what we teach and what uh, all indigenous tribes, so far as I know, teach, that our spirit returns to the creator. Um, that, uh, however, it is that, um, they get there. However, it is we have prepared in order for that journey uh, to occur. Uh, that if you uh, follow those ways and follow those ways consistently, then uh, they don't they don't do a test uh, at the doorway to say, "All right, to tell us the uh, you know tell us the twelve teachings that go with the sweat lodge, or tell us the uh, how the Sundance ceremony works," because not everybody who's indigenous knows those things. Uh, so they don't challenge in, in that way, I, I, I truly believe. Uh, I think what it is, is they ask you to talk about the life that you led. Did you treat people with kindness? Were you courageous when you had to be? Were you honest with people? Um, did you love people? Uh, those are the things that I think really uh, need to be thought about. And... I think the the fact that uh, Christian 
followers for so long, uh, spent a long period of time oppressing indigenous people and denying them access to their own culture and taking their culture away from them or taking them away from their culture, their traditions and their teachings and teaching them that it was wrong and inferior. Uh, it's their souls that I worry about uh, because at the end of the day, what, what, what will they say to God when they see him about how they have lived a life? Did they live a life consistent with the way that God wanted them to live? Um, and uh, maybe they can justify it. Maybe they can't. I don't know. But uh, it is truly a, uh, a challenge to live life properly. And however it is that you can do that, I, I always wish people well. Um, so I think I know lots of indigenous people who follow the Christian way of living and uh, and I wish them well I, when they, they talk to me about that. Uh, and I know that it comes from a place where maybe their parents or their grandparents or they themselves may not have been given a choice um, that uh, it maybe alienates them from other people within the indigenous community, but that's on them, not on you. As long as you are living a good life, then that's what's key. Thank you, Senator. And the last question for this evening is, um, I am wondering how to deal with anger that Indigenous people are feeling. Be kind. That's all I can tell you is just be kind. Understand it. Um, if it's anger directed at you, then don't respond in kind. Um, but be kind to people who are uh, suffering in anger or the results of the way that the life has uh, impacted them. Uh, because uh, we have a long way to go in order to overcome the history of this country. Uh, it uh, was 150 years of oppression that uh, we've had to experience and some of that oppression continues even today and it will continue for some time to come. But if we start acting properly now in a way that is consistent with each of our teachings, then we will address this in a way that uh, allows us to be able to develop the kind of relationship that we will be able to stand before God and uh, say with pride that I did what I could. Thank you. Well, we've reached the conclusion of our evening. Senator Murray Sinclair on behalf of Assumption University and everyone here for sharing his insight and wisdom with us. I'm sure that we've all benefited from uh, your, your talk this evening and uh, hopefully we'll encourage everyone to promote uh, interfaith dialogue and, and peace. Uh, in addition, I want to thank our uh, co-sponsors for this evening, Canterbury College and Iona College, Dr. Gordon Drake and Dr. Norman King for uh, sponsoring or co-sponsoring the event with us at Assumption. I'd like to thank our team at Assumption for making this event possible, particularly Cassandra Skipper, who is the uh, IT uh, person behind the scenes, making sure that everything is running smoothly. Uh, Cecile Bertrand, Moira Belmore for assisting as well. And uh, I'd like to thank all of my colleagues from across the country for uh, helping to promote the event with their various institutions, all the way from the Atlantic regions to, uh, to the Rockies. It was uh, an amazing turnout to see so many university presidents uh, with us. And of course, our, our friends from uh, Shingwok uh, for, for uh, attending this evening. And, and oh, Shingwok, incidentally, I, I, I promise I would acknowledge Shingwok. Hello. That's right. <laughs> I told the senator that uh, they, you were coming and, and uh, he was very excited to hear that. And, uh, and of course, our audience members, I want to thank them all for, uh, for coming. We had uh, quite a large turnout, well over 100 people. Uh, and I know a lot of people are Zoom fatigued, as, as they say, but that uh, that's, uh, didn't stop them. So thank you all. And uh, I want to conclude, Senator, with, uh, with the little word that I, I learned, an important word. Uh, and it, uh, a, a dean, a dean, is that how it's pronounced? To say hello? I mean. And I learned that it actually means 
uh, it greets the light within you. Is yeah. that kind of the etymology from it? So uh, recognizing the light within you. So I, I want to say that hopefully we can all recognize the light within us and uh, continue to uh, to cultivate the good and promote uh, promote peace. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Senator, again uh, for joining us. And I wish everyone a good evening. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Bye now.